whatever kind of bag I packed. I've lost it. No, it's, it's here. It's here. It's here. Right. Um, I don't. I don't have everything still. Uh, but I got bits and pieces. So this was always ready to go. It's always ready to go. Um, I confess to say that's that's part of it. Okay, I need one of those for emergencies. <laughs> Spare shoelaces. Okay. If you're in a war zone, no way to buy shoelaces. Um, another absolutely vital. Bath plugs. Bath plugs. Okay. First thing that dis happens in war zones is the bath plugs disappear. You need two. You need a. Why do they disappear? Uh, everything disappears. Everything disappears. People, people hoard. And I think you might need a better set of charms. <laughs> charms are important. If you look in there, you'll find a piece of, um, of water snake skin. Where did this well, come from? They're all sent to me by my viewers, you see. And this lady assured me that the water snake skin would keep me alive. This is a crocodile tooth, or it could be an alligator tooth. It's, 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 it's split. Um, you have and here. you don't know which one of these actually kept you alive. Well, that's why I keep them all, isn't it? <laughs> because, I mean, you can, it would be, be foolish to discard one because you don't know which is working and which isn't. These were sent to you before you were hit by shrapnel? Uh, some before, some after. As most people thought that after I'd been shot, I wouldn't go back to do it, you see. Martin Bell was hard at work, as usual, first thing this morning. This is his 11th war and the most dangerous. This morning, Bell was at a notorious sniper's corner filming civilians under machine gun and shell fire. A mortar bomb exploded close by and shrapnel hit him in the stomach and groin. Shells continued to fall as his colleagues came to his aid. They're here. They're here. Okay. I'll survive. I'm alive. That was my five minutes of fame, you know people as if it's kind of heroic to be wounded. It's just daft. I mean, I didn't have to be wounded. It was my fault. And I felt rather ashamed because I got out of there so fast. I had an armored vehicle to take me to the UN field hospital straight by air ambulance to London. The trapped victims in Sarajevo did not have these advantages. Uh, I was kept out of the war zone for three months and it was too long. So I was preternaturally cautious when I went back. I was then not taking risks I should have taken. Sometimes you reproach yourself for being crazy, and sometimes you reproach yourself for being a coward. But whatever you do as a war reporter, you're going to have a life full of reproach, self-reproach, you see. New improved model, BBC. Just feel the weight of it. Can I try it on? Try it on. Gosh, it's so heavy. <laughs> I can't... Do you actually wear this thing? Well, I'm going to tell you in a minute. Okay, I'm so stuck. That. And that's not part of it. I mean, it's then so you heavy. then, you have to add these heavy-duty ceramic plates, they, they, oh they, they gosh, buckle in. I never wore it. I wouldn't wear this. It weighs too much. It cripples you and it slows you down. And but, it... So I would wear them. I wore a blue one, just to put my appearances on camera, huh. to keep the BBC happy. But you couldn't interview somebody in the street wearing a flak jacket. They're not wearing one. I am. Mm. It's extremely discourteous to the point of cowardly, you see. Hmm. Dan, I know, had sent his flak jacket a week before hmm. to the tailors in Kenya, and he was going to have all sorts of zebra print on it. Yeah, yeah. I wonder sometimes if that would have helped, if they would have spotted that. Or... No, I think not. No. I think that was... hmm. I use wide-angle lenses more than telephoto because the closer you get to the action, the better. A lot of people who get killed, get killed very young. Maybe they're too enthusiastic. Maybe they don't assess the risks. They, we all believe we're not going to be killed, but probably the belief is more securely lodged in the mind of somebody very young. Mm. The other people who get done for are simply those who play the odds too long, you see. If you do it year after year, mm. I mean, sooner or later, there's a piece of lead with your name on it, I think. Mm. We can't be heroes because we can get out whenever we want, more or less. We're not trapped in there. We're there of our own volition, so don't feel sorry for us and certainly don't admire us. It's, a, it's an interesting way to earn a living. Come on, you have a front, front row seat at the making of history. That's why we're there. When I do get spotted taking a picture, the most important challenge is not to show fear. I try to look confused or pretend that I don't understand a thing that is going on. But to get flustered is a recipe for disaster. If people find your weakness, they will toy with you like a cat with a mouse. Hi, uh, guy. There's a new sheriff in town. I'm going to clean up this place. 
Once I went with Dan while he took photographs of the Nairobi riots. I was terrified. He wasn't afraid for a moment. At least he never showed it. Perhaps that's a prerequisite for a job on the front lines of war. Christiane Amanpour has a reputation for being as fearless as they come. She has a passion for her work and never seems to doubt its value. But does she ever feel afraid, or has she simply learned to control it? I started at the bottom, completely at the bottom, and they said, oh, you're foreign, go on the foreign desk. This comes from the Pentagon, uh, their command center, and they track me, apparently. <laughs> that, I think it's a joke, frankly, but it's sweet, isn't it? That. And they track me where I am, and, and a lot of places I go, um, <laughs> some of the American military say, we always wait to see where you're going because we know we're going to be there when shortly there's after. There's war, there's Amanpour, that right? That kind of thing, yeah. I'm Christiane Amanpour reporting live from Mogadishu. We believe that we have seen the first Navy SEALs we're land ashore here at the Adult Somalia. Feeding Center in Baidoa. Just earlier, we showed you the admission room. There was also a lot of civilian damage. Let me try to give you some detail that may put a human face on some of what's going on. The real story of what's happening here is still to be told. There's another launch. Christiana Amanpour, CNN, That's Sarajevo. Now I'm Christiana Amanpour, reporting live from Mogadishu. I think I'm proud mostly of what I've done in Bosnia. I believe that we journalists did our duty. We went there, we stayed for years. And we did what we are mandated to do. We told the story. And you said that, you know, you couldn't be neutral in Bosnia. And, um, you know, Martin Bell had, had talked to me about his journalism of attachment, where he's inspiring people to care. Yeah. What, how would you describe well, your... Well, I am a great friend and colleague of Martin Bell's, but I don't call it journalism of attachment because I actually don't believe that that's what it is or that that's what we should be doing. But what I do think is that we have to understand the principles of our profession. So in this case, everybody sort of glommed on to the idea of objectivity and they said, Christiane has perhaps lost her objectivity. She's identifying with one side. And I said to them, no, understand what does objectivity mean? It means giving all sides an equal hearing. Mm -hmm. It means seeking all sides of the story. But it does not mean treating all sides the same. Sometimes it's appropriate to be detached, and sometimes it's highly inappropriate. And I again mentioned Bosnia, where our responsibility as human beings was on the line, and where morality entered the equation we were faced with a situation in which genocide was being perpetrated in Europe 50 years after World War II when all our governments said never again. And it was happening again. This is a routine Saturday in central Sarajevo. Bosnian gunmen defend against Serb snipers 100 yards away across the front line. Several passers-by have been hit. At least one is dead. Mr. President, it's a privilege to address you from Sarajevo. You tonight just said that Bosnia was just a humanitarian catastrophe. Surely, sir, you would agree it is so much more than that, a fundamental question of international law and order. But I'd covered Bosnia for the last several years, and I was listening to what the President had been saying about it in that forum. And when it came time for me to ask my question, there was simply nothing else I could ask. Why has it taken you, the United States, so long to articulate a policy on Bosnia? Why, in the absence of a policy, have you allowed the U.S. and the West to be held hostage to those who do have a clear policy, the Bosnian Serbs? And do you not think that the constant flip-flops of your administration on the issue of Bosnia sets a very dangerous precedent and would lead people to take you less seriously then you would like to be taken? No, but speeches like that may make them take me less seriously than I'd like to be taken. There have been no constant flip-flops, madam. His reaction.